are getting into the kind of final throws of the Western history portion of Art uh, Fundamentals, which, thank goodness, uh, it is quite large uh, to try to recap everything. Uh, the Gothic, uh, we see pre-Renaissance, right? Pretty much the, uh, let's say, like the 10th, 11th century through the 14th, early 15th, we see the Renaissance era, the uh, 14th, late 14th, 15th, and, and 16th centuries. Uh, we see the Baroque dominate through the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and then we see the Rococo, but the two we focus on are neoclassical uh, and the Romantic eras, uh, Romanticism genres uh, in the early 19th century and late 18th century. Um, and then we start to see the uh, battle against this and impressionism, right? The kind of battle against uh, the the rigid rules of the era, right? And then we see post-impressionism come into its own uh, as a again not necessarily a genre in and of itself, but more of a kind of disparate group of impressionists. Uh, uh, of styles influenced by impressionism, right? Whether it's colors, whether it's the use of forms, right? Whatever it is. Uh, and then from there, we get into our modern genres, which were quite a few, uh, as we talked about last period, uh, period, Fauvism, Dada, Cubism, uh, Expressionism, um, the list goes on. Um, and then today we are covering kind of the most modern of the eras, uh, abstract abstraction, uh, and what we will also note as abstract expressionism. Okay. Uh, and that's, I think that's going to pretty much end our, we're going to, you know, we have pop art coming up, but, but uh, it's, we're pretty much towards the, um, the end point here, right? Um, with abstract expressionism being a major art form or art style uh, to this day, right? Okay. And we start our discussion about abstraction uh, in World War II. Uh, and during World War II, art pretty obviously uh, comes to a standstill with lots of artists uh, fighting in the war. Right. Um, and most other people just not caring about war. Um, we do see if there is any art produced during World War II, um, we see propaganda as the major art form of the, of the era, right, to serve the war effort. Right. Um, <clears throat> And then when the war is over, um, we see Europe in recovery mode, uh, which leads to the full uh, kind of annexation, let's say, of the art world uh, by New York City, right? Um, uh, so New York uh, becomes the center of the art world. And it'll take decades for the centers in Italy, England, France, and Germany uh, to regain some sort of uh, uh, influence uh, akin to New York. Um, and in the 1950s, right, we see the art scene in New York dominated by um, the, the by critics, right, uh, but specifically two critics. Um, art scene dominated by uh, the critics um, Harold Rosenberg and Clement Greenberg. Uh, Harold Rosenberg and Clement Greenberg. Okay, so these two are kind of the tastemakers. They're almost like the salon or the academy of previous uh, generations, right? Um, they had a massive influence on art style, right? Basically, whatever they liked became uh, one of the major styles of the of the decade, right? Uh, and in particular. Greenberg uh, promotes a certain type of art, right? Um, uh, and he really advocates for abstraction, which again is the kind of lack of a subject matter uh, in the art, right? Um, <clears throat> and then in the 1940s, if we kind of go back a little bit in time, uh, 1940s, Kandinsky's ideas, right? Kandinsky's uh, dictum, right? His theory. Uh, that um, art is free from the limitations uh, of pictorial subject matter, right? Art is free uh, from subject matter, right? It doesn't have to have subject matter, right? Art for art's sake kind of thing. Um, leads to the formation of a new genre, uh, abstract expressionism, which is a mix, obviously, of abstraction and expressionism. 
right? Abstract being, you know, again, the lack of a subject matter, expressionism being this idea of trying to, to um, engage emotions through art, right? Whether that's in the viewer or in the artist themselves, right? Um, so as we see, right, the direct presentation of emotions, a direct presentation of a feeling uh, with an emphasis on uh, dramatic colors and sweeping brush strokes. Sorry about the uh, loud engine in the back. That is my AC unit coming on and off. <clears throat> uh, dramatic colors and sweeping brush strokes. Okay. Um, and they pointed to a lot of abstract expressionists. Um, let's go through some of them. Uh, Willem de Kooning. Uh, we have Lee Krasner. We have Franz Klein. And the epitome of this style, or at least of action painting style, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, Jackson Pollock. Okay. Uh, let's get some dates on these guys. Uh, Willem de Kooning, 1904 to 1997. Uh, Lee Krasner, 1908 to 1984. Uh, Franz Klein, 1910 to 1962. And uh, Jackson Pollock, 1912 to 1956. Okay. Um, uh, Pollock in particular, he's even going to abandon, uh, he's going to abandon uh, painting with paintbrushes uh, uh, and instead just starts to drip uh, art or drip paint onto the canvas, right? Okay, and let's take a look at uh, some of the art of these gentlemen. Uh, if I can find where I put it, uh, right here. Okay, let's go back to F11. Uh, so this is an artwork of Willem de Kooning. Again, you're just it's it's a very clearly abstract, but also you can see the emotion of the artists in the very strong brush strokes, right? Um, here we have a painting by uh, Lee Krasner. Again, uh, no subject matter, so abstract and expressionist in that it very, very clearly got some emotions going on that he's getting out on on the canvas, right? Lots of energetic brush strokes. Uh, Franz Klein, here we can see again, no subject matter, very strong uh, emotions being put into this, especially with the kind of contrasting use of black and white. Right. Um, and then most famously, of course, is a Jackson Pollock. Again, abstract, no subject matter, expressionist. You can see kind of the, the emotion of the man uh, through his kind of um, his, his use of the brush strokes and, and probably not even brush strokes here. Right. It looks like he's kind of just throwing the paint onto the canvas at this point. Right. OK. Um, so. Um, Let's see here. Uh, so as I pointed out earlier, abstract expressionism tends to fall into two fields. Uh, we have action painting, which again is a big is a big part of uh, Pollock's style. Uh, action painting, which uh, employed dramatic brush strokes. As well as Pollock's very famous uh, dripping technique. I just drip paint onto the canvas. And the other one we have, if I can somehow get an arrow down here, uh, is going to be what's called color field paintings. Which are pretty much exactly like they sound, right? It's broad areas of color. And very simple uh, geometric paintings. Okay, uh, and two of the most famous color field painters are Mark Rothko, uh, who in my hometown of Houston has a uh, a Rothko chapel that has some uh, that all the walls are color field paintings. It is phenomenal. Uh, and then Joseph Albers, who we actually recently talked about as being. Uh, one of the professors to make it out of the uh, Bauhaus school in Germany and into the United States. And let's take a look at some of their art. Okay, so here's a Mark Rothko. Um, again, another 
a, a small story of my time. Uh, my English teacher had a Rothko print in her classroom and uh, in high school, and I hated it. I thought it was terrible. Um, I thought it wasn't art um, and had very long arguments with her about this. And then as I kind of grew older, uh, and even especially went to the Rothko Chapel, kind of, you know, they, they create a meditative feeling, right? You can kind of just stare into the deep colors and and really kind of start to feel uh, some sort of emotion, right? Or at least some sort of meditative aspect, at least I did. Uh, and then here is a Joseph Albers, which is even more geometric uh, than Rothko. And it also kind of recalls back that picture we looked at of the different uh, tables kind of nestled within each other, right? Okay. All right, so, uh, the, so we have a response to abstract expressionism. We have a response to what's called, we're going to shorten to ABEX, right? Um, we see uh, a return to naturalism by some artists, right? Um, that uh, uh, it, it, this is an interesting return to, to naturalism, right? Because what we see here is that um, we have some similarities to abstract expressionism, uh, especially with the, the kind of um, the different, the materials used, right, and stuff, and stuff like that, they don't necessarily talk about the, um, the similarities, they just say it's similar, uh, but they, what we see is they focus on consumer objects, uh, and if you, uh, participate in the 1960s year, you will know these guys quite well, um, the two men they focus on is, are Jasper Johns, who is uh, born in 1930. He might have recently passed. I need to, I'm gonna check that real quick. Uh, I think he might have passed recently. I feel like I heard that. I could be totally wrong though. Uh, Jasper Johns. Nope, he is still alive today, ripe old age of uh, 89. Okay, Jasper Johns, um, who created a series of, of uh, common things, right? Uh, especially uh, one of his most famous ones being uh, one about flags, right? But then he also had one about uh, numbers, maps, and letters. And right, we'll look at the flag here in a second. Uh, and then the other most famous of these artists is uh, Robert Rauschenberg. I believe both of these men are American, which again kind of signals the shift to the United States as the major uh, art center. Right, uh, who lived from 1925 to 2008. Uh, and Robert Rauschenberg uh, creates sculptures from kind of cast off objects, the ready made uh, style that we uh, associate with Picasso. Uh, cast off op from cast off objects. Uh, and these, these sculptures. Uh, he, he created, he would call combines, right? Basically combining all these different things um, into, into one, right? Um, and so the two artworks they talk about with him are bed and monogram. Bed being made in 1955, monogram in 1959. Okay, uh, and bed is he hung his own bed clothes on the wall. So it was like his sheets. And I guess maybe his pajamas, uh, bedclothes on the wall, uh, and painted them like a canvas. Okay, uh, and then a monogram uh, has a numerous amount of, of found items. Uh, and fortunately for you, we're going to have to list all of those. Uh, it includes, uh, let's see, a stuffed goat. Uh, you can actually see the picture in the resource. Uh, stuffed goats, a tire, uh, a police barrier, uh, the heel of a shoe, uh, a tennis ball, and of course, it can't be art. It can't be art without some... Oh, I got two words stuck in my head at the same time. Uh, tennis ball and paint. All right. Um... And so uh, we're going to see the the use of uh, the use of everyday objects uh, in uh, Rauschenberg and other people's art. Uh, use of everyday objects, 
um, is going to have a big influence on pop art, which is going to be kind of our next and, and one of our last new genres. Um, but that is it for abstraction, abstract expressionism, and the kind of return to naturalism that we see here. Although I think these guys tend to be called abstract expressionists. And uh, let's take a look at some of these paintings. Here's Jasper Johns's flag, um, which I believe is made out of old newspaper clippings right, and painted over. Right, and then here's Robert Rauschenberg's bed. Uh, again, you can see kind of the sheets at the bottom, uh, but they're painted over by Rauschenberg. And then, since it's hanging right, we kind of see them drip down. Uh, and then lastly, here is a uh, monogram, right? Um, which you can see the police barrier. You can see, obviously, you see the goat in the tire, right? Uh, I can't see the heel of the shoe. Um, I can't see that, um, nor can I see the tennis ball, but I, I can assure you they're there, at least according to the resource. Um, and that's going to do it for action expressionism. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next